We uh, appreciate you joining our uh, live Q&A today about debugging Kubernetes or what to do when it goes wrong, because it will. And uh, join with me here today, uh, I'm Tim Stahl, head of pre-sales US here at Appia, um, and I'm joined by uh, Graham and Solomon. I'll let, let you two uh, introduce. Graham, if you want to go first, you're first on my video over here. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, so yeah, Graham Coleman, I'm a, a, a pre-sales engineer for, for Appia. Um, long background in in IT, Kubernetes, distributed computing. So kind of spent many years at Red Hat uh, working with OpenShift and prior to that working kind of in the integration and JE space. I'll hand over to Salman. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's good to see some familiar faces. Yavor, welcome again. Uh, yeah, awesome. So my name is Salman Iqbal. I'm a solutions engineer at Napier. I think it's my uh, title has changed recently. I'm not sure, but I am a solutions engineer at Appia, and I have been working with Kubernetes for the last three and a half or four years. And I'm, I'm, I'm come from, I come from developer background. I've been a developer, but I've been doing like Kubernetes work for the last three and a half, four years. I uh, mainly focus on machine learning inside Kubernetes, so trying to run Kubernetes workload at scale. And scale, uh, yeah. So that's that's me. And teaching people Kubernetes. And teaching people Kubernetes. Yes, that's that's what we do too. That's yeah, correct. and talking at meetups and, and talking. <laughs> yeah, just doing a few things here and there. You can go and search for Salman, you'll find him everywhere. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So yeah, when um yeah, and I'll just let you know this is a an informal. Uh, so this is a live Q and A. Feel free to ask any questions. Come off mute. You'll notice that everybody is uh, allowed to talk. So if you you have something while we're doing this, you can throw it in the chat and throw it in the Q and A. You can unmute. Uh, feel free. We'll we'll make this a discussion. So, um, you know, with with that, I'm just going to go ahead and hand it off. <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, I think uh, so. There's a few things we we thought we'll discuss, but uh, before we do that, um, one of the main things that we, I think we we're going to focus on is what actually happens when you deploy your application in Kubernetes. Uh, so we're going to focus on that when you deploy an application in Kubernetes. What does it look like? And more importantly. What are the things you need to uh, watch out for when you're deploying an application? So we're going to deploy a simple app uh, initially, see how how that goes. It'll, we'll uh, talk about some debugging techniques while while we deploy it, and then uh, Graham and Tim are also going to talk about some some other issues that you might come across, some some errors that you might have seen always, like crash loop back off and uh, whatever these errors might be. So. Um, Everything I just... run into every time I deploy something, basically, is what he's saying. <laughs> yeah, so every time you try to deploy something, because there's so many moving parts, it might seem like there's a lot, but um, hopefully we'll try and uh, we'll try and we'll we'll do a demo, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, so if I, I'm going to share my screen for a few minutes, and um, we'll go from there. If if you're expecting something else, please let us know. We're going to talk about that too. Whatever you need to discuss, we can. Talk about. So let me just bring that up and make sure I can see everything in here. Okay, move that. Right. Can you, what can you see? Yeah. Can you see the right screen? I've got like a worker. Perfect. Now. So, uh, real quick, we have a Kubernetes cluster, uh, we have a control plane, and we have two worker nodes. And then uh, basically the control plan and the worker nodes, uh, we, when we submit any of your applications that need to be deployed, we deploy them, we submit them to the Kubernetes control plan. Control plan receives the request and it deploys, tries to deploy uh, anything, deploy workloads inside um, your worker nodes. So you could have as many workloads as you like um, on, inside the cluster. But in this case, I'm showing there's two. I have a local cluster which is running, you could use anything you'd like, but that cluster itself just has a, a single node. Um, so that's what that is. And what actually happens when we deploy, uh, where, are, where are we going? Here's the bit. So here's the thing. What does the structure of a Kubernetes application actually look like? You deploy, you create what's known as a pod, as you might be aware. Um, and inside a pod, you define what kind of um, image you'd like to run. And we'll show an example in a few minutes. And you can deploy that pod. Usually, we don't deploy a pod. We deploy what's known as a deployment because deployment has uh, some information about uh, what we're about to deploy, so the name of the image and how many replicas we would like to have. Um, and then deployment looks after 
that uh, that pod. So if it crashes, it'll bring it back up, uh, back up to the desired state. That's fine. It will run itself. But what about if you have multiple replicas? Uh, if you have multiple replicas, how do we decide where to send the information? How does one application that's running inside a pod communicate with another application? This is where we bring in what's called a service. And a service is, you can think of it as an internal load balancer. It decides where to route the traffic to. And then that's all internal though. What if you want to access the website outside of the cluster? That's where we create an ingress. And this is what we're going to do. I'm going to create a deployment. We'll have one replica initially. We can change replicas if we need. And then we're going to create a deployment. And we'll talk about once you do a deployment, how do you know what you've deployed is correct? Or how do you debug the issues? Does that sound good to everybody? Let us know in the chat. Uh, chat anything from you, Tim. And, uh, and... Graham. Graham. <laughs> I was just moving the screens across. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Perfect. So. I am going to do this, clear that, make it a little bit bigger. So I have a cluster. If I do kubectl get nodes, you can do that yourself as well. So this is um, a cluster that's running. Per perhaps we can stick this information that we talk about in, in an email as well. We'll send it over to you later on. So I have this, uh, this cluster. It's just one node, and I haven't really deployed anything inside. This cluster, I can do kubectl get nodes, kubectl get pods or deployments or anything like nothing is deployed in the default namespace. So it's not there. We're going to go ahead and now create a deployment. So I'm going to bring up the code. We are going to run a container, but which container? Well, let's just try and run the container itself first. So this is Stefan has created this container. Uh, shout out to Stefan. Um, pod info. So if I can just without Kubernetes. Imagine this, this is just a static page. It serves a page, which you'll show, which we'll show in a second. I can do I can do this thing, Docker run, and I can try and access the pod container first to make sure it's all correct. If it, if there's something wrong, um, we'll figure out, uh, we, can, we can see there's something, you, we can have a look at the container itself, but here's what we can do. I can do this, I can use this flag dash P to connect my machine to what's running inside the container because the container is isolated. And um, I can do this dash docker run dash p flag and the container itself, when it runs, it the website runs on this port 9898. So I'm going to do that, 9898. So now this is running and what is done is attach the port uh, 9898 inside the container to port 8080 on my machine. So if I were to bring over a, uh, let me just bring it here. Localhost 8080. I can see this 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 page that's been displayed. It's um it's got just a static page, it's nothing special. But I can check the container is running, right? But we know this is a container, and this is what we're gonna deploy inside the Kubernetes cluster. So here you go. And <clears throat> let's open this deployment file. This is what a deployment file looks like. And there's some information in here. Ignore this for a second. We'll come back to it. But uh, at the top, it's a big enough. I think it's big enough, right? You can all see. Um, at the top, we've got some information about what kind of resource we're creating. We're going to create a deployment. If I come down to the bottom, this is perhaps the most uh, useful bit. What kind of image we would like to run? So this could be any image that you're trying to run. This is going to pull this image from the container registry. And then a couple of things in here. We've got the name. We have image pull policy. And more importantly, what port does that website run on? Because it's a website. And then what we've got in here is a bunch of labels. Uh, we'll explain labels in a few seconds. Why, why do we need them? And this is where things usually go wrong around labels. Um, <clears throat> and what we've got in here is some, some metadata information. So what we're going to do is create this deployment. And then we will check what happens when we do this deployment. Uh, we're not running. If, you, if I wanted to deploy multiple re replicas, I can just come in here and change the replicas to four or whatever, but we'll just deploy one replica. So that's the deployment file. If I do kubectl apply minus f deployment.yaml, it's going to come through and it says that deployment has been created. So I can check that, just make sure it's all correct. This is this. Got to do this. 
He says, yeah, there's one pod. It's up and running. That shows it, it's a good sign that stuff is running. And I can check the pod itself. So Salmon, quick yes. question. So where it says ready one slash one, what does that mean? Uh, excellent question there. Uh, so because in a deployment, uh, we can define replicas. So in the deployment in here, we can say how many replicas we're running. In this case, if you don't define the number of replicas, it will default to one. So all this is saying is that uh, you asked for one and you have one pod, which is ready. Um, that's the desired state configuration for Kubernetes. It brings you close to state. If I change this to two, and if only one was up, it will say one out of two already. Does that answer your question? Yeah. That was, a, that was an excellent question. Uh, and a uh, follow on, how do you know, how does Kubernetes know it's ready? Oh, excellent. Very good. Uh -huh. This is this 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 is really good. How does Kubernetes know your your container or your pod is ready? There's two things inside Kubernetes. There's some probes in Kubernetes that you can use. There's a readiness probe, and there's a liveness probe. There's also a startup probe, but there's a readiness probe that you can configure. For example, you can say, well, if you know when when your application starts up, you can you can check if the process is up and running. That's where you use a liveness probe. But your application could be up and running, but your application might not be ready to serve traffic. Perhaps it needs to load some data from, from a database and upload it in a cache. So you can configure uh, this readiness probe to check against your application and say it's ready. Now, you didn't see me configure that at all. If I don't say it to it, that configure a readiness probe, it will assume it's up and ready. We're lucky in this case because it's just a static page. It's ready to serve traffic. But this is something that you can look at to check if it's, uh, uh, you know, if your application is ready or not by configuring these probes. Yeah, Maybe that can be a topic of discussion for next time, right? Yeah, because it's kind of one of the things, if you're debugging, right, and, and it's Correct. Not, it's never ready, so your container's not in a ready state, take a look at the within the, the readiness probes that it's been, has it had any configured? It might be that something's configured that's pointing to something that's not loaded, or it's a static web page that it's trying to reach as the as the probe, but that's not loading. So it's the type, type of thing you can kind of first look at. Why isn't it ready? Yeah, that's <clears throat> excellent. Yeah, so I think that's yeah, that's that's perfect. That's a that's a really good example. So this is liveness or or readiness is similar check, but I'm gonna use this liveness example mm -hmm. as uh, as Graham was saying. You define in your probe. So this is liveness probe. You can define the readiness probe, and th exactly what Graham was saying. You have to configure a path in your application. You have to give an endpoint. Oh, this is the endpoint that we're gonna use, and and in that you can write any logic you write you like, and usually written in this case you're going to return a http code 200 if you get a 200 that means it's all good if the process is up and running it return to returns 200 you know like oh it's it's live but you can write any logic you like and as graham says check if this is correct um if the path is correct if the port is correct and also sometimes your application might take a little while to start up a little while to get ready so you can add in some delays in the beginning so it doesn't start checking until it's actually ready to be checked. Um, so that's the probes. Yeah, that was very good. Very good. Could that be something like, <clears throat> you know, you had a dependencies like a database or something like that. Mm -hmm. and you're waiting for that. You know, if you're deploying all this at once, you're waiting on that to come up, give it like 20 or 30 seconds for that to finish doing what it needs to do and then spin up and kind of go from there. Yeah, I, I guess you can use it for that case. Uh, one of the things that people tell people say not to do is uh, make these microservices reliant on other things. So if they if they fail, uh, you, you know you you will end up with this uh, cyclic cyclic dependency. This is not ready, so that's not going to be ready. So something else is not going to be ready. So yeah, something they have to watch out for. But yeah, that's 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 a good example as well. Okay, excellent. Oh, keep those keep them keep them coming. If there's any. Q and A's or anything like that, please, uh, please let us know. Well, and I'll say real quick. Um, I apologize. I realized the chat was disabled for some reason. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank you for for that. Um, I went ahead and updated that, so now everybody should be able to. I was wondering why it was so quiet. <laughs> uh, awesome. Also, as well, come off mute if you want to just ask. Yeah, me if you want. Just yeah, feel yeah, free. Okay. As long as Tim's enabled people to come off mute. <laughs> yeah, let me the thing is. <laughs> Cool. Go away and check, Tim. Go away and check. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. <laughs> so our our pod is. Let's go back to where we were. That's a very good discussion there. So if I do cubes to get, uh, I have pod which is running. I can also check the logs of the pod to see if your application is 
logging anything to standard out or standard error, um, then basically you'll see something that looks like this. You know, it's just showing you log. That's also another way of checking everything's good. And this is what you, what Graham was also talking about, the status that's running. That's the liveness probe telling us. And then we've got this uh, uh, this ready state, like actually the pod is ready. Now this this tells me it's ready. But I need to be able to check what I've deployed is actually correct. But as you remember from this diagram, I can't really see this thing from outside the cluster unless I deploy a service and I deploy an ingress. And that's what we're going to do now. We'll deploy a service and an ingress. But what if, like in a container you just saw, I could do this port forwarding and uh, and check it out? Um, but can we do something like that with pod? And we can. In a pod, we can port forward using kubectl, so we can just at least test if the pod is running correctly. I mean, all the things that we talked about here are looking okay because we got the pod that's running. I can see some logs. There's no errors, but we can check this. So I can do like this. I can do kubectl. And I can do something that looks like this. This pod is running on port 9898. So I can do kubectl port dash forward. Then what kind of instance uh, resource I'm trying to port forward? So I'm going to say pod, and then I can stick the name of the, that resource, which is pod info. And then I'll pick a random port on my machine. Let's pick 8083. And then which port this container is running on. I know that because... Uh, when I build a con when when the container is built and it, it's logging as well as telling it it's actually listing on port nine eight nine eight. So if I run this command, if I open a browser and if I go to localhost eighty eighty three, I should see that page like you saw before. This is eighty eighty two. This is eighty eighty. We we'll check that deployment in here. So let's do this. Localhost. Locale missing an L. So the first thing you do in troubleshooting Kubernetes is check the spelling of your URL. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Yeah. So this is this is basically we got all we got the website that's running inside the pod. So that's all we've confirmed so far. We we haven't gone all the way yet, but that's we're just building up. So that's confirming. Yeah, the the pod is running okay. Now what we're gonna do is deploy our service because we need to do something like this. We need to map this up. And how do we map it? Well, let's just have a service YAML file in here. You can see this service YAML file. It's quite straightforward. There's a few things in here. The service itself needs to target a port. So let me show you another slide here. Basically, this is what we're looking at. We have a pod and we have a service. And the, the pod is running on a uh, container port and the service is running service has what's known as a target port we need to match these things and we need to make sure these two are matching in our configuration yaml files so let's go back to our yaml file this is saying port target port is 9898 which is correct because that's what the container port was <coughs> 9898 we're matching that that's another thing that you can watch out for when you do a deployment things don't quite work you get an error perhaps the ports are not mapping correctly so have a look just make sure the ports are right and one thing, if I can, real quick, while while you're doing that, we had a question come in, um, and I, I'm a little late to it, but um, that uh, Michael had asked, what role does this, the uh, describe pod play in your health checks? Very good. Let's do that. So, kubectl get pods. Very good, uh, actually. So one of the things you can do with this command line tool is you can describe um, all kinds of resources. Describe the scr. I B pod and then the name of the resource. You can even also do a slash. So let's let's do that. Let's describe this pod and let's see what kind of information we get. If I scroll up a little bit, um, it provides you more information, more detail than what you do with just kubectl get pods. You got this information in here about like the name, which namespace is running it, container ID and stuff like that, blah blah blah. And it's also giving you some information about is it ready or is it not. But if you go to the bottom. There's some, sometimes you get this information in here about the events that have happened. So it started, it pulled the kubelet as a component. I think that's a topic that I'll probably discuss next time around. Or uh, what are the different components in, uh, inside Kubernetes? I think we might have a video on, on our YouTube channel. I'll, I'll, I'll find it and, and I send it. 
in, in a few minutes. But this gives you some more information. If it errors for some reason, some of that information, you might see it in here. Um, I can't remember exactly what kind of information comes in here, uh, but you might see it. Graham, you might remember some. Yeah, it's just the so so Kubernetes has an event um, a collection system. So there's events get posted by all of the components inside of Kubernetes uh, and all the resources. So you can get you can just grab all the events from every namespace across all the cluster, or narrow it all the way down to what are the events that this is a pod you've looked at that this pod has has um, uh, sent out. So this. If the if the pod is sending out events, so there's some standard events that come out of just the pod spec, um, which you'll see there. So the kubelets kind of started container, created container, and things like that. And you'll also get something coming out of um, you know, it, it, you'll see errors. So if it's uh, if it can't pull the pod, so mm. it's coming out of uh, or or it um, it's pulled the pod <laughs> but it can't start it successfully because it's errored. So you'll see things like that in just as events being. Uh, being pushed out by the by the pod. Yeah, so that image pull back off is another error. Yeah, that uh, basically they tries to pull the get... image, which maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe you don't have a. Maybe you misspell this thing in here uh, instead of pod info. I wrote something. Maybe I don't have the right version. Maybe I don't have access to the, to the repository it's trying to pull it from. This is coming from Docker Hub, which is open, so that's fine. The way it works in Kubernetes, you will try and pull it, and then you'll get get this error called image pull back off basically it slows off trying to pull an image and it completely stops pulling an image i think after 10 10 minutes or something like that um so yeah, that's so, an error that can so happen so if you've not seen that before that so that image is just the the docker the, the docker container image that's set yeah. in a repository somewhere and that's just the address to it so it's a, yeah. um because it's defaulting to docker hub and trying to find that that um that you are that address for that docker mm -hmm. image so so yeah. if, you, if you misspell that, you'll see it as an Im image pull back off because it just can't find the image because you've misspelled it. So go and take a look at that. Perfect. It's funny, you, wish, it, you kind of wish they would have just said, can't find image. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah. Hey, uh, Tim, I guess because the, the, the history of that? Well, it's it kind works of happened if it did that part of it that we can go talk to. Because <laughs> yeah. there is a back off, right? So it'll try and pull the image, but it'll back off for a, a default time period. And then go and try and pull it again, just in case there was a, a network issue or a communication issue or something. So it will keep on trying. Uh, for, for And you can configure that in, once you get into the depths of how your the, the container orchestration system works. So, um, which is why it's an image pullback off. It's not a can't. It is a can't, but I can't yet. But I'm, I'm going to try, try again. yeah. Just try yeah. again. <laughs> Give it a little time. Try again. Okay, excellent. So, so far, what we've got is we've deployed a pod we have a service uh, that we're going to create in a few seconds, and we just need to make sure these two things match. There's another thing we need to make sure that matches, which is if I hop back in here, if you look at the service, um, so deployment, a service could point to multiple deployments, uh, or it could point to a bunch of pods that are listening into a deployment. How does it know which pod to send the request to, or which container specifically send the request to? In here, as you see, we don't really specify the name of the deployment anywhere. Uh, all we do is specify the name of the service, which is, which I call the pod info. The way it picks the pods that it needs to send the information to is using what's known as a selector. Uh, and a selector, you select the label. And labels are defined in here under this bit here, selector match labels app pod info. And what do you describe, define here? You have to define here as well. Now, uh, usually I just copy and paste a, a YAML file and just change the things that need to change. So that's what we follow. But that's how it picks um the pods now these this label is is a deployment label but this doesn't have to be the same these two have to be the same but i just kept it same for the simplicity of it but um that's basically two things we need to match we need to make sure the ports match and we need to make sure the labels match so if something is not working the deployed things are not working just check maybe the ports are not right maybe the label is not correct so um, just just as a step back from that salmon so mm -hmm. i guess for the guys and the guys and girls on the call it's kind of the so a pod just will just run in a, a, a across all of your the uh, the worker nodes within your cluster. Doesn't matter where it is, it'll run somewhere. Now you can't you don't know where it's going to run. The scheduler for Kubernetes will run your pod somewhere on any one of the nodes. So the service is a way of decoupling where that pod is going to run on any one of the servers on the worker nodes. 
Um, but Kubernetes will understand where it's put that pod and the service is a, a, a way of addressing so you can address the service and the service will know where the pods are running in, in the cluster. So you need that service to be able, because if a pod disappears and moves onto another node, Kubernetes knows about it. So, so the service will change its load balancing to point to where it knows the pod has been moved to. All you need to know is the service address internally. So yeah. it's a way of just decoupling when a pod disappears and moves to another node, you will always address the service, which understands where what where things have moved because the schedule will update the um, information in, in its internal database. So, so that addressing, we're not using you know real addresses to for the service to link to the pod, we're just using a label, and, and Kubernetes does everything through labels or not everything. Most yeah. of the most of the clever things it does through labeling. So, it knows when a service is, a, a pod has moved. The service will try and will will link up back to uh, the pod with that label running on that's been moved somewhere else. So hence why the label bit's really important. Perfect. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So we've got these labels here, which is which is what we're trying to select from. Now we'll create this service. Uh, so let's do that. And then how do I know? what I've created is correct, like is fine or not. So, well, I can do this same thing, get service, pod info. That's the one that I created. Kubernetes has its own service for, for doing its own stuff that's already running. So that's now created. And I, I we, def, we tell it to run on a specific port. Well, it could be any port, you can pick anything you like. So that's what, um, that's what it's running on. Now, how do I check if it's all running? Well, you don't remember I did port forward before. I can do that again. But this time for a service pod info, and I'm going to pick another port 8085 this time. And this time, the port of the service itself is 3000. So if I run this, it will do similar. So if we go localhost 8085, and if we still see the page, that means what we've done is wired everything correctly. Just to, just to prove that not every port is running everything. You can see this 8086 <laughs> doesn't have anything. Is this is like this is a real thing that's that's not I have deployed stuff on my on my local machine to run like that. So now, <laughs> sorry, go on, Graham. You're gonna say something? No, I was just laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Which banter important. I'm laughing at. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's important. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. So so basically, just making sure everything is now correct. So so far, what we talked about is what can go wrong. So the bits to watch out for labels, as Graham was saying very important and the port itself this target port make sure that's correct and you have different types of services we're not going to go into that today but you have different types of services you can expose them externally to how do they work internally that's another that's a matter for uh another time but uh that's what this uh the service is just like an internal load balancer as uh as graham was saying if the pod goes missing we have multiple replicas which one do we pick let the service decide abstraction now, the thing is, I need to be able to access this outside the cluster. Uh, it's all well and good. We're trying to do port forward, but imagine it's a website that people need to access. You can't give everybody kubectl command line tool and say, hey, just port forward it. That's not right, because you have to set set everybody up on that. And this is where we use Ingress. Ingress, you can think of as an Ingress as an external load balancer. So we send a request to it. And then in here, we write some rules using this Ingress YAML file. Um, you can give it any name you like, the file itself, but this is important here, kind. And you have annotations which do like uh, additional uh, features for, for Ingress, but the more important thing is the rules in here. I'm, I wrote this HTTP rule that says for any request that goes to the root of this, send it to the service called PodInfo, which is running a port 3000. So what we're doing is, is trying to trying to match this basically service is running on a port and then we have an ingress with service.port and we need to match that once that's matched and the name of the service too of course uh you saw in the yaml file name of the service again things to watch out for if it's not working check the port check the service ingress uh check the port number check the service name see if it's all correct um 
let's go in. And if you have multiple rules, you can write multiple rules in here. You can say, if somebody goes to forward slash login, send them to a different service. If somebody goes to forward slash, you can add multiple. Every time you see a dash, that means it's a list. So you keep adding them uh, in multiple uh, multiple times. So if I apply minus F ingress.yaml. Now, the way ingress works is it actually spins up in the cluster itself. It will create another component that will look after all the requests that go in. So you can't really port forward in ingress, but you can port forward this, this ingress controller. We're not going to do that, but if you needed to, we can check it. The way in Minikube you can access stuff is you can get the Minikube IP. That is an IP locally, which is exposed, and I can access the website. So if I type this URL and we see this page, that means we've configured all of this correctly and everybody's going to clap and we'll say we've done a deployment from top to the bottom ingress service and a pod everything is correct so if it doesn't work we can try and figure out why it didn't work oh it worked so it's got pod info itself is clapping which is good like uh, so what we've done is we've gone through and you can ping this or whatever it's just show you that but we take we create a deployment we create a pod and then we have the service and we have this ingress so that's what i wanted to share in terms of um, of that, um, right? There's other things also can that can go wrong after this deployment. Uh, Graham, what else would like to mention? Or are there um, any questions? By the way, I don't know if yeah, people, yeah. does questions. it all make sense? I have enough questions first. Yeah, yeah. Come off mute if if you've got a question um, about anything, but specifically, have you got any questions for? Well, maybe not anything. Um, nothing personal, just mainly Kubernetes and what we've just seen. My question is, what is that thing supposed to be that's clapping? <laughs> <laughs> it's open to interpretation. Whatever you think it, it is what you want it to be. <laughs> nice. I'm afraid of it. <laughs> you can be afraid of that. It looks so cute. <laughs> that's why I'm afraid of it. <laughs> um, um hello hey yeah um so um thanks for the opportunity my name is ibrahim um this is the very first time i'm really having to interact with uh, or see somebody interact with uh, kubernetes uh, on on premise um the first time i put it on the chat that uh, i actually interacted with uh, kube was on google um google cloud um, so it's actually a good one. However, I came across Minikube or, or kind um, yeah, as a part of, um, I was playing around with VS Code and I, I saw Minikube or kind on VS Code. So if it's possible to actually provide, uh, I'm trying to respond to um, Graham's uh, comment here. I, I wish you could actually expand on it. Um, which is most preferred? Uh, mini cube or kind or and what is actually the difference yeah sure so um so they're they're both locally running kubernetes uh instances so if if you're using gcp or aks or eks they that's kubernetes running in the cloud for you um so your options are if i want to run something locally on my laptop so i can do some just really kind of quick dev testing and doing something local then you've got a few options so you can you, you can actually just install a Kubernetes cluster from source into a into a, if you're running Linux on, on your laptop, fine. You can run it into there, or you can create a VM with Linux on it and run it in there. But don't do that because that's horrible, <laughs> and you'll be in, you get in just in a world of pain. So the other options are so Minikube is is exactly the same, but it's been packaged up into a VM uh, and has just a. a, a a, a kind of control around Minikube where you can just start up Minikube and it will create a, 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 a Kubernetes cluster inside of a VM. I think it uses Vagrant, but um, it will just give you access to a Kubernetes cluster. Minikube is quite good that it gives you additional extras on there. So you can, for, for the ingress, for example, that Salman was looking at, you can deploy an ingress controller inside of Minikube using the Minikube controls uh, commands. Um, and there's a, and there's a ton of stuff that Minikube will wrap outside, give you wrapped outside, but that'll all just run on your laptop, so you can use it and deploy things on your laptop. 
Kind is similar. Um, so Kind will run Kubernetes. It stands for Kubernetes in Docker. Um, Kubernetes in, what's the N? I think it's K-I-N. Okay, -N. in D. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> Kubernetes in Docker. So all you need is a, a Docker, um, Docker runtime. Uh, so whether you use Docker or whether you use Podman, whatever, you can run Kind inside of inside of that runtime, and that will spin up a, a Kubernetes instance in, inside as a Docker container on your machine. So it's just a great way of of just getting Kubernetes locally. Uh, it's pretty quick to spin up and spin down. Um, the drawbacks of it is that it will consume a lot of your resources on your laptop. So if you try and deploy any reasonable size application inside of Kubernetes in one of these environments, it'll it'll run like a dog. And um, so you've just got to be careful with what you run inside of it. It's great for exploring, great for poking around, because you can't you can't do anything, you can't damage anything. Um, but it's got its limitations. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And and then it takes me to my second question, if you wouldn't mind. Um, many times, a number of um, environments, I've seen them use hybrid environments. So um, you have um, this locally running locally, and sometimes you just want to make it work with um, with the cloud infrastructure. Does this come in handy when you're trying to do that? And um, how easy is it for you to actually make it work in a hybrid setting? So, so when you work in hybrid, so there, there is no direct link between what you do on your local machine and what you and moving that over to a, a another kubernetes environment so the the way that people do this is so first of all you've got your docker images and your docker so the actual things you're running that will be in a registry somewhere so you wherever you shared that docker image if you're moving between your local environment and your cloud environment they both need to be able to access that container image so wherever you're building application code and pushing it as a Docker image, that has to be shared between the both. Now, getting things deployed into that Kubernetes environment is all about the manifests that, that, that Salmon was just going through. So the deployment, the pod spec, et cetera. So if I've created an, an, a deployment uh, manifest on my local machine and tested it, which pulls in from a, a container image that I know is shared with my cloud environment, then that's portable, right? You can port the, you can move that directly from what you've deployed on your local machine into running the same file on your cloud environment. So that's the artifact, the, the kind of the shareable artifact that might go into your CI CD process or use tools such as Helm or other things that will kind of build a, a manage your Kubernetes deployment. Um, so that's kind of where 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 you kind of move out, move between the environments. You can use the same manifest, right? It'll pull the same pull the same uh, container image in it, or run the same things. So that that's kind of the shareable part of it. So is Helm like a template that you use for Kubernetes or something? Yeah, yeah. So if you're just starting out, then probably avoid Helm for your own thing, you know, use Helm to go and grab, you know, I want to deploy a, a MySQL database, go and use a Helm chart and use that to deploy your MySQL database. But for your own, if you're starting out and just building your own app from scratch, just create the templates, uh, create the, uh, the, the, dis the manifests, so the deployment and the, the service and the ingress, create all that separately. You can go into templating it once you've got to do this at scale. And, and you want to just get an easy way of templating deployments and services. That's my advice anyway. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, I'll say when I started in, in Kates, I, I tried to start directly with Helm and just immediately got lost. So that was good advice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once you've learned what the, you know, what a deployment looks like and what the types of data, what types of um, information you need to put in there, the metadata you need, um, and once you learn the ingress and the service and and just getting used to those artifacts, hey, then it's easier to go to Helm because you can kind of understand what you're, you know, a bunch of it's just boilerplate. And that's what Helm's there for because you can boilerplate most of it and there's only a few things change. But you need to understand that to start with. Uh, 
Ibrahim, thanks thanks for the questions. I've I posted the link for the webinar we did last week. It was around Helm, why do we need it? Uh, and how to get started and how to do it. That's that's I'll just post it. It's on YouTube so you can check it out whenever you have time. Actually, it, it only went to us. So there we go. Oh, did I? Not okay. put it to everyone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. But yeah, and, and also something to know too, if, if you have ideas or of topics you'd like to see, we already had a couple submitted earlier. Um, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we're we are absolutely open to doing what you want. <laughs> so giving you what you're you're asking for. So um otherwise we're just gonna come up with something each week. <laughs> so if there are things you're generally interested in or would like to deep dive on or have questions about, please throw them in the chat and we'll we'll add them and add them to the list. And uh Michael, see you have your hand up, please feel free to to come off mute and Ask all right me. all right thank you very much um thank you since we're on services um thank you everybody um just trying to um ask um for some for some countries you basically wouldn't be able to deploy in the cloud because of um gdpr process of some countries in africa um so um the question is um if we're not on the cloud on your premise um do we have any third party type of ingress solution we could use for deploying i know i know uh, that um um, Nginx has something that basically seen it with um Iqbal has done something about it, I remember, but is there something else we could basically deploy? That seems to be pretty complex deploying the Nginx um, ingress solution. Could you just um, throw more light on that? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's probably there's more than ingress. I think it's it's the whole platform that you'd need to take care of. Um so it kind of depends on, on well, it mostly depends on where your data sits. So where, where, wherever I'm processing data, if I'm in a region where I'm not allowed to go to the any of the public clouds, then you've got to be looking at you know, what can I do on-prem, what can I do in, in a self-managed, or, or finding a hosting provider in your region that keeps the data in a uh, in, in somewhere that, uh, that that's within the regulations of that environment, uh, that country. Um, so it's it's not just ingress. I think you, you'll need to deploy a, a Kubernetes on-prem solution. So, and there's a few out there. So, you know, you can look at things like OpenShift and Tanzu or, or just do it yourself, Kubernetes. You can download and install and run and manage Kubernetes yourself. Although why anyone would want to do that, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, some, sometimes it's, you know, actually, no, there's no reason why you'd want to <laughs> run your own, build your own Kubernetes because, yeah. Yeah, pe people like you know Red Hat and OpenShift and, and VMware and Tanzu, and there's a bunch of others that kind of add a whole heap of value and stop you from stop you from creating the mess of your own, of your own DIY Kubernetes. But it's it's complex, right? So you've 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 got to understand what um, a where you've got to understand where your data is and where your data processing sits. So in which case, if it's in a data center on data on on um, somewhere where you control, then obviously you'll need to have access to that and it will flow through your DIY Kubernetes or on-prem Kubernetes. If you can't use public cloud, hey, I feel sorry for you, but it's you've got to you've got to look at some of the other oh, yeah. products, products on the market. I think just to just to add to that specifically around ingress, uh, everything that Graham says is absolutely correct. You can still deploy your ingress controller on there. The the way ingress actually works is you have you have an ingress pod. Uh, let's say it's Nginx, and you usually have a service that you can expose externally. So it's be, it'll be something like node port, which just opens a port on the node, or load balancer, uh, service type load balancer. And if you do a service type load balancer on the cloud, it actually provisions a real load balancer in front of the machine and wires the load balancer to the ingress pod. If you're on-premises, how do you do that? Well, so you can have uh, you might have come across this project called Metal LB that if you're doing, if you're on premises you can because you, what you need is a service type load balancer or node port this this project called Metal LB I'll share the link in a second that allows you to have the service type uh, node port or load balancer uh, on premises and that probably solve your specific problem that's how you solve it using that project uh, mm. you can expose that I'll share I'll share the link to Metal LB in a second. All right, thank you. No worries. Hopefully, I'll share in the right place. Uh, let's try again. <laughs> this is all right. Everyone, everyone, here. Go. That's that's metal LB. Check out that. Uh, is load is service type load balancer. In this case, you just pick that. Uh, yeah. 
so so those ingress controllers like the, the metal lb or the engine x or um traffic or, or any any of any of the kind of the the load balancers are really just load balancers right they're just deployed mm. into or not a kubernetes cluster um you can have well you can have a physical hardware load balancer if if you want <laughs> it's kind of you can configure that an f5 load balancer which just sits in front of your kubernetes cluster and balances across what it knows in in, in the services <clears> in the ingress so as because there are plugins for the that. node port and it would know based on health check if that service is running on it or not and add it or remove it from the pool yeah, yeah. But goodness you're taking me back about 10 years but <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, you know yeah. it's, it, there's some industries in finance which have got okay. oh yeah okay uh, from some of the training that i've seen um basically they'll tell be wary of um the load balances that sit on the cloud that you pay extra costs for for them so um how does the ingress play in um, public cloud do they provide an ingress um, there or it's basically you pay extra cost for that or you can deploy your ingress in the public cloud also so you can so as Basically, you have to um, the ingress controller itself runs as two parts as as a controller, which is running as a pod. You still have to expose it outside of the cluster. That bit needs to be exposed. You usually end up with just one uh, load balancer, and you have to pay for it. It is what it, you got to pay for that load balancer, and then you can write all your rules inside it. So you have to pay for one load balancer. What you don't want to do is imagine you have your services. You don't want to expose every service with its own service type of node uh, load balancer. Because you'll end up with like 50 load balances. It's just useless. That's why you want to expose them through an ingress itself. So yes, you you can. So when I was doing Minikube, I actually have to run this command where I have to install ingress in my cluster because ingress doesn't come by default. Um, so you pick your type and you can configure it. And when you configure it, it will spin up something, a load balancer that will make sure that when the requests are coming from outside of the cluster, they can go to the ingress pod and then the ingress pod looks after what where the request needs to go next, what needs to happen. Does that answer your question? Silence, I'm going to assume yes. Um, yes, it kind of answers, but uh, the question actually is, um, mm -hmm. are you allowed to deploy your ingress in the cloud? Or the, or the cloud already has an ingress uh, controller in place? Yeah, so it depends. Uh, yeah, you have to choose. When you when you're deploying it, you choose which component you're going to deploy, and in all the cloud providers, you can pick your own ingress controller because it's just a pod, and you can deploy multiple ingress controllers in your cluster. It doesn't doesn't matter. It's like any other deployment. So yes, you can deploy anything you like inside. Uh, some cloud providers have got their own. So for example, in Azure, you can use their application gateway as an ingress control as as an ingress controller. Now that works. Um, but yeah, you can deploy whatever you like. It's just a normal deployment at the end of the day. Um, that's what it is. You can deploy what you want in the cloud. Thank you. No problem. Good question, Alan. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think uh, I'm going to share one more thing uh, around this debugging thing, uh, which was uh, there's a lot more that can go wrong, and then maybe we can we can start wrapping up on that. Uh, our friends at LearnKates have uh, put this blog together. Uh, it's like a Kubernetes training thing. And uh, I'll share this. So you can check this PDF. Uh, I'll actually, let's open it in uh, PNG. So when, when we were doing a deployment, uh, you know, you, you saw, am I sharing the right screen, by the way? Yeah. Yep. yeah perfect. Excellent. So this is also going to walk you through some of the steps that you have to do when you create a deployment and when things go wrong. Check the pods are running, why they're not running. Maybe your cluster size is too small. That's a problem as well. You run out of resources. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, this is one of the tips, tricks that we're doing. Check, do portfolio, check if the pod is running, check if the service is running. And it's going to take you through a lot of stuff in here and explain a number of things. Uh, check if the service is running, check if the controller is running. But at some time, it's going to come around and say, just have a look at Stack Overflow. If uh, <laughs> nothing works. That's my favorite part of this diagram. <laughs> just to check, to check Stack Overflow, copy and paste in there and find out what's wrong. Um, but definitely check this blog out. It's quite useful. Um, I know people have printed this and put it on on the walls and stuff to debug this. Uh, when you're starting out new, this is this is a very useful um, useful uh, uh, resource to use. I'm I'm gonna put it in chat again. Just make sure I do it in the right place.
Uh, I think Tim's already put it in there. Oh, you put it in there. Perfect. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, I think there is, there is a, there is definitely a flow of, I mean, I've certainly got it. If things aren't working, I just get into a routine of I go and check, you know, go and check my pods, go and check the events, go and check the, the logs on the pods. If it, if it looks like that, go and check, uh, if I've got a replica control controller that's running, go and check the replica controller, get, get the events from there, describe the things that I'm looking at. Um, and that will give you any of those things will give you a good clue. You know, if, if it can't be scheduled onto a node because of the node sizes, then it'll tell you in one of those things. So you'll see it in the events that the scheduler is having a problem scheduling the pod to be, to be uh, running on any of the nodes. Um, so that, that, workflow is a great useful tool to use and, I, and i've seen it and used it and it's and it's kind of you just get into a habit of understanding all the moving pieces once you start getting lots of moving pieces in terms of applications deployed with you know maybe with uh um different networking and uh different storage persistent volumes and you know what there's a hundred and one things that could go wrong or thousand and one things that could go wrong so um it starts getting really hairy right? it, once you get down to the levels of actually i've checked all these things i still don't understand why why my pod is is not running um and that's for me that's the difficult thing in kubernetes it's when i've got a really complex deployment the it's exponentially large the things that can go wrong and, and, and i need to check on um because there's 50 things to check with just one pod running in a deployment. So, but use that workflow. It's um, it'll it'll help you dive into and diagnose the problems um, pretty pretty well. There's some other stuff actually. Just just as we've got time, that it's probably worth looking at. Maybe not for this 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 Q and A, but looking at things on so quite often you'll you'll deploy a container image that just doesn't start which is nothing to do with your kubernetes configuration it's something to do you got something wrong in your container that doesn't start I mean, it might run locally and you go hey it runs locally put it into kubernetes hey why isn't it working worked on um, my computer. yeah i worked on my computer um and doing things like you know, that there are other tools you can kubernetes tools you can use uh, that will attach to a running container so you can take a look at it and, and debug it before it explodes uh, and, and isn't working on the machine um, as a probably in on the kubernetes docs it talks about it so kind of in it containers and debug containers um, which i'll pull the link out if i can find it Chat amongst yourselves while I find this link. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just enjoying the sound of it. Sounds like you have a mechanical keyboard. It's an it's just an old keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you not trying to be trendy. I just have an old keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> they all used to be mechanical back in the day. <laughs> yeah. 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 Meanwhile, I, I didn't see what was cool about it. It's kind of like, well, it's my keyboard. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so here it is. So. I'm not used to the Zoom share screen. Yeah, it's, it's, a little showing, different. it's showing my, my iPhone via AirPlay. That's quite cool. <laughs> so can you see the can you see the screen? I'm yep, showing yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. So, um, so yeah, go and take a look at this. It's kind of debug running pods. So it's got a lot of the things we've talked about, um, and and kind of this is the this is the one which is always kind of gets me as difficult debugging kind of pods. They're in pending state, right? They've done something. They're not quite ready. State is impending, um, and, and if you scroll down to. Uh, uh, we didn't even look at this kind of debugging with container exec so if your container's running you can you can get into the runtime of that pod and kind of have a poke around to figure out what's wrong um and these things here are quite cool so using an inferno debug container so if i've got a container that doesn't have a anything that i can attach to 
then I can use an ephemeral container that's that I can attach with that running container, which I'll be able to then kind of use to poke into because it's sharing the process. So go and take a look at some of these pages because um, there's some really interesting things in here as well. So I'll post that. Oh, just got it. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Tim. I figured I'd be useful. <laughs> Always useful. Always useful. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm guessing we've got five minutes before we wrap this up. So if there's, I guess, any other questions from anyone? Be... Or again, any any ideas for content you'd like to see or <clears throat> information you'd like to have, please feel free to throw it in the chat or, you know, reach out to us at any time. We're, we're more than happy to uh, take your suggestions and, and, you know, make some, make some uh, good video around it here for you. All right. Okay. Well, with that, we uh, we really appreciate everyone uh, joining us today uh, for our second live Q and A. Um, again, we'll be doing these weekly, and uh, we'll post them on our our usual outlets uh, via email and socials. So feel free to follow us on LinkedIn and YouTube and Snapchat, probably, and all the other things that that we do. <laughs> probably I not. Snapchat. I don't believe you on Snapchat. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> you forgot TikTok. Ah, there we go have we got a tiktok channel no <laughs> we don't need one <laughs> but uh but yeah uh that's interesting we we actually we do have a um a question came in do we have a discord channel we do actually have a community slack um that is out there um if you pop to i will get the link to it right now actually yeah Let's see here. Where's that link to me? So we just redesigned our website and now I need to remember where we put it. Well, there it is. Um, so we've got this. Let me grab this link here real quick. It is at via community.slack.com. So if you feel free to uh, pop in there, join that. Um, all of us sit in there. So you can feel free to ask, uh, ask any questions uh, in there and, and all of us see it and we'll be more than happy to respond. 